Well, when you start examining other temples around the world, you realize that these other temples have a lot in common. That is, they're all very, very difficult to explain <laughs> with vine ropes, copper tools, no pulley, and so on. One Egyptologist, the director of the Gizo Plateau, said, there is not one grain of evidence of any advanced civilization ever having been in Egypt prior to the Egyptian. And I thought that was one of the most accurate statements I ever heard from an archaeologist. Because if you're looking for grains of evidence of sand, you will miss it. If you're looking, if you got your head in the sand, you will miss it. But if you look up from the sand and stop looking for grains of evidence, you will see millions of tons of rocks right in front of your eyes giving you some pretty damn good evidence. The Grand Pyramid of Giza is made of 2,300,000 stones. 2,300,000 stones, it stands at 481 feet of altitude. Its base is 13 square acres. That is extremely large. When you take survey picture, satellite picture of the apex of the Grand Pyramid at Giza, it is one quarter of an inch off the center of the base. That's 13 square acres. 13 acres square one quarter of an inch off center. That's after placing 2,300,000 stones that you have cut with copper tools. <laughs> yeah, you need some pretty good moonshine to do that one. But I guarantee you that is extremely difficult to reproduce. In fact, there is no way engineering companies on this planet could ever reproduce that. Even with all of our modern technology, if we give them billions and billions of dollars, they couldn't come up with anything like that. Because if you cut, if you divide a quarter of an inch error by 2,300,000 stone, the accuracy at which you're placing these stones is outrageous. And we can't do anything like that. Our most accurate buildings like um, telescopes are not that accurate. They're not even close to having that kind of accuracy. Go ahead. So you could say we've just barely come out of the dark ages. Basically, or we got into the dark ages. Yeah. And because we, it seems that there was people that were doing a heck of a lot better than us. So what I'm, when I was looking at this, I'm like, wait a minute, that doesn't happen that way. If you, if you know, why is it that we think, you know, that this is taught as facts to children in schools every day, that the pyramids were built by people pulling on vine ropes. <laughs> And you know why? Because in the 1800s, a bunch of in English archaeologists showed up in Egypt, and that's the only thing they could come up with. And because they had PhDs and they were very respected archaeologists, since then, everybody is repeating the same thing. And somehow, a theory that's completely unproven became a fact. In fact, you will not get a PhD in archaeology if you say anything else about the pyramids. I guarantee you that. You cannot get a PhD in archaeology by saying the pyramids were built by little green man. <laughs> this is one of the problems with education. 
a whole bunch of people repeating at what they've all been taught doesn't advance the field very rapidly. Because everybody is repeating the same thing, you're not going anywhere. So, uh, you know, but they, these archaeologists never actually, you know, I, I, I know they're not mathematicians, but this is simple mathematics, okay? You take the number of stones, they tell you that the pyramids had to be built in 20 years, okay? So that the dynastic Egypt worked. And then you calculate how fast they had to put the stones in. At, at seven days a week, 10 hours a day, 365 days a year, for 20 years, they had to place the stone every two minutes to finish the pyramid on time. With that level of accuracy, never mind. But then the archaeologists say, no, oh no, those were farmers. They could only build the pyramids during the time of the flood of the Nile when they couldn't work in the fields. Three months out of the year. See, when they had that three months vacation, hey, let's all go and build a huge pyramid. <laughs> so they went out there and built pyramids three months out of the year. You redo your calculation. Now they have to place a rock every two seconds to make it in 20 years so that really doesn't work um, because it's not like you can take these huge rocks and average two tons some of them up to 40 tons rock like in the king's chamber there's a hundred slab of 40 ton pink granite rock okay these things at 135 feet of elevation in the pyramid it's not like you go, hey, Joe, catch this one. Hey, Joe, catch this one. You know, and the other guy on the other end is like putting them in. You can't do that. And it doesn't matter if you got 100,000 people. You still can't do it. And if, and, and you know, they tell you they did that by rolling the rocks on logs. Well, they might have not noticed but these pyramids are in the middle of a desert. <laughs> you need a lot of logs to move 2,300,000 stone. Where did the wood come from? When you ask them that, they say, oh, they imported it from Europe. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Was this like some catalog, you know, 1-800 ordering? Because like, as far as I know, the Egyptian didn't like, you know, easily navigate it into Europe, cut millions of logs they would have needed, and brought them back. There's no evidence of that. <laughs> so, uh, but, but even more fundamental, I'll ask you, you know, even more fundamental, the fundamental axioms of archaeology is that you observe and uh, decode the remains of a civilization to understand its morse, morses and its, its, you know, its activities and all this, right? Okay. There is over a million aeroglyph walls in Egypt thousands and thousands of aeroglyph walls in Egypt in the temples in the tombs everywhere they tell us how they made love they tell us how they eat they tell us how they went to the washroom they tell us everything about their life everything not one of those walls mentioned building the pyramids <laughs> what they forgot <laughs> you're talking about something that would have taken a huge effort you think they would have put at least a little wall somewhere saying oh by the way we built the pyramids <laughs>
No. <laughs> None of that. In fact, the archaeologists say not only that the pyramids built, uh, that the Egyptians built the pyramids, but they say that they built them as tombs. Okay. What's the evidence? Zero. Zilch. Not one, py not one pyramid was ever found to host a mummy. Not one mummy was ever found in a pyramid. Not one. And I'm not just talking about Egypt. I'm talking about all around the world. And it's funny because you know how they do all these like historic, you know, history channel and all this stuff. You know, they have all these nice documentary. And they show you where they found the pyramids and the, you know, and the, and the tombs and all this and Tutankhamen and all this. And then they splice and they cut directly into the pyramids. So you think the mummies were found in the pyramid. But in fact, the mummies were found, most of the king's mummies, were found in the king's valley, far from the pyramid. Some of the pyramids, they had to dynamite their way into the pyramid. They couldn't find an entrance. When they got inside the pyramid, there was the sarcophagus, the so-called sarcophagus in the middle. It had a slab. Some of them had slabs that were like 40 tons slabs sealing the sarcophagus. They would unseal it, pull the slab off, still no mummy. What was their conclusions? Grave robber. <laughs> <laughs> Those grave robbers, they were unbelievable. They, they just walked through the walls because they had to dynamite their way in. So the, those grave robbers got there before. They must have walked through the walls, got in there, picked up the 40-ton slab on top of the sarcophagus, pulled all the stuff out, including all the bones and everything else, which, you know, wonder what they would do with and then you know closed it back up resealed it right, just to make sure they didn't disturb anything <laughs> and then walked back out with all of this stuff this doesn't make sense now there's other things that don't make sense there is nowhere on these pyramids that it says I built this for my tomb, I was born then and I died then. You think if you built such a great monument, at least you put your name on it. <laughs> <laughs> There's no hieroglyphs inside the pyramid. And Lord knows that the Egyptians put hieroglyphs everywhere. So why didn't they not write inside the pyramids? You know, so those are all huge contradiction to the concept that the Egyptian or the Mayans or the Incas or the Chinese or so on build their pyramids. <laughs> you know? That's all logical. Pyramids were not tombs. Pyramids were not built by Egyptians. No Egyptian text talks about the Egyptian building the pyramids. The texts do talk about monuments enormous monuments being built and who they say built them was the sun god the Mayans the Incas the Chinese the Japanese all cultures that have these buildings none of them say we built it all of them say the sun gods taught us how to build how to talk how to write how to do all this stuff this is an ancient, ancient symbol that was found on a granite pillar in uh, Abydos, Egypt, in a temple called the Osarian Temple. Why is it that this object, this drawing, which is on the 100-ton pink pillar, 
in the middle of that temple is not in any picture books or history books anywhere or archaeologic books anywhere it took me 10 years of research to go through all the books that were written on the Azarian temple from the first papers that were published from the archaeologists that found the temple to eventually you know all the papers and the books that were written none of them had this picture in it the way I got this picture is that a friend of mine went out there and took it okay why is it that this picture is not in there I'll tell you why because this graphic is not carved into the rock it's not etched into the <laughs> rock this graphic is actually burnt laser burnt into the atomic structure of that pillar now when you think of ancient civilization 5,000 years ago you don't expect them to be doing laser burn on you know hard surfaces at high levels of accuracy okay archaeologists have a really hard time explaining these things when they can explain something usually the tendency is not to popularize it so they leave it out some of these uh, symbols that are in the Arzarian temple there's a, there's no writing in all of that temple not one piece of writing all there is is these things there's a few of them some of them are chipped well the laser burn is through the rock so that actually even if you chip it it still appears on the rock we have no current technology to reproduce this that's why you don't find this in history books the other thing is that the Azarian temple is 50 feet below all the other temples at Abydos the archaeologists tried to say oh the Egyptian dug 50 feet and then started building well the Egyptian never did that to any other building and actually when the geologists went there they went no that's not the case the building was there and sedimentation piled up beside it well when they calculate how long it would take to get 50 feet of sedimentation that temple is no longer four to five thousand years old that temple is nine to twelve thousand years old maybe ten thousand years old that's why archaeologists really don't like that temple <laughs> in fact they very rarely discuss it the sphinx most people think that the sphinx is built the Sphinx is not built. The Sphinx was carved. Uh, the Sphinx was carved right out of the enclosure of the Giza Plateau. Now, when you look at the paws of the Sphinx, you might notice that there's like brick-like structures on it, so it looks like it's built. Those are repairs that were done later in history. But the Sphinx was carved, and actually there's evidence that the head of the Sphinx was recarved. It used to be a lion's head, but it was recarved into um, a pharaoh's head by one of the pharaohs. However, there is erosion patterns on the Sphinx that is a telltale sign that the Sphinx had to be carved when there was a lot of rain uh, hitting it because of the erosion on it we know when the last time this area had a lot of rain that was 
approximately 10,000 years ago, which matches the Orzarian temple at Abydos. These blocks here consist of the uh, Sphinx temple. They're the blocks that were removed from the side of the Sphinx to carve the Sphinx out. Now, if you were removing blocks from the Sphinx enclosure to build a temple in front with the blocks, would you use a 100-pound block, 500-pound block, maybe even a 1,000-pound block? Even like three or four tons pound blocks. <laughs> that would start becoming a problem with our current technology, especially in the sand. And especially if you gotta stack them. <laughs> okay? But the ancient Egyptian and or whoever ten thousand years ago built this then remove a hundred ton, uh, 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 a hundred pound block. They remove two hundred tons block. And we know that they were removed from the enclosure because the stratification of the layers of rock matches uh, where they were removed from. And you can actually tell which rock went came from exactly where in the enclosure. 200 ton. See, this is a little person here. See what I mean? It's not trivial. You don't just grab a 200 ton block with your buddies and move it over there. The current most uh, we actually at this time lift about 200 ton with the largest land crane on earth. And we move it only from a truck bed into a boat. We can't roll with it. We can't go and like move it around the sand and certainly not. we can't stack them on top of each other to make a temple. 10,000 years ago Somebody was moving 200 ton block with ease. I think this is fantastic. You know, because this is about our true history. This is about what happened on this planet prior to our current history, prior to our current thinking. Look at this statue. Ramses the second. When they found this statue, it was laying like this, and it had fall over, fallen over in the desert. It's made out of pink granite. It's perfectly polished with copper tools. <laughs> and uh, this is a person beside it. The statue itself, uh, want, when they found it, they said, "Oh, let's just move it over there because we're going to build the we're going to build the the uh, the Ramses Museum." So the engineers came and they said, "Well, okay, but then we'll have to p cut it in pieces because this thing is." approximately a thousand ton solid block of granite a thousand ton that is five times more than what we can lift today with a land crate so instead they build a museum around it much <laughs> This is not the only thousand ton block that was found. At, you know, the pillars on each side of the entrance of, of temples in Egypt, they are called obelisks. Many of them were in excess of a thousand ton. And they all come out, all these large objects, 
come out of a quarry that we know where it is. It's hundreds of miles up the Nile. And the quarry is on the other side of the Nile over a mountain range. Okay? When you ask archaeologists, how this, did this get there? They say, oh, oh they, they cut the trench from the Nile across the mountain range into the quarry and then they let the water in and then they picked up the object they stuck it on the barge and they floated it down the Nile but there's no evidence of that trench ever being cut how do you lift up a thousand ton object and put it on a barge without sinking it I mean that is just not appropriate it just doesn't happen so when you look at this you start to wonder who were these sun gods and were they able to go all around the world under the water in Japan recently pyramids were found. These pyramids are at 19.47 latitude. Uh, they're enormous pyramids. All the fishermen knew that they were there but they didn't think it was important so they didn't tell anybody. And here is uh, another picture of these slabs. They're huge. They're huge blocks. What's really interesting about those is that you see you can't date a pyramid you can't date a monument because carbon dated dating only carbon dates <laughs> you need carbon rock doesn't have much carbon in it not enough to date it it has silica and it has you know a certain rate of decay and all this you can date how old is the rock but that won't tell you when it was caught and assembled into a pyramid okay so actually archaeologists don't date the monuments they just find the bones of this poor fellow beside it or they find a fireplace beside it or something and then they carbon date that and they say oh it's this dude that built this thing <laughs> You see? But when the pyramid goes under the water, oh, now it coral growth starts to happen shortly after. And that's carbon datable. So now you can tell at least when the pyramid went under the water. Well, when they carbon dated these pyramids, they went under the water at least 10,000 years ago. The meltdown of the last ice age. When the water rose and covered the earth. There is over a hundred, uh, there's over 500 flood stories in ancient civilization all around the world talking about an advanced civilization that was there prior the sun gods and the flooding that occurred that destroyed morals of that civilization here we might be seeing some of the vestiges of that civilization but anyway these pyramids were found in Egypt and these ones are datable to 10,000 years Check out this picture. This was taken during the Second World War by um, by an American pilot that was lost over China. And he saw this pyramid and he, he took a picture and he brought it back home. He survived the whole thing and brought the picture back home. And everybody you know a few years ago when I would present that people would say oh well that one is iffy you know this could be a hoax well okay 
Nobody believed them. Except that the Chinese government last few years have released these pictures. There's hundreds of pyramids in China. And uh, the Chinese government actually got the farmers to farm on top of the pyramids so that they wouldn't be so apparent by satellite. <laughs> and the reason why, so here's the poor farmer that got the job. <laughs> The reason why they were doing that is because they didn't want the Western world to know about these pyramids. Why? Because the legends that come with these pyramids is that the sun gods built them and that the sun gods were blue-eyed, blonde-haired people. As far as the Chinese government went, uh, looked at this, Blonde hair, blue eyed people had to be Europeans. And the last thing they wanted was European people being responsible for some of the most ancient knowledge of the Chinese tradition. So they didn't want those pyramids to be known by the West. They did find the mummies of these blonde hair, blue eyed people in the high desert of China. Over 500 mummies were found. All very tall, absolutely not Asian people. And then you go to the forbidden city of China. The city that holds all the knowledge of the universe all the knowledge of the sun gods and at the entrance of the city is the sphinx the lion which in both Egypt and Chinese tradition are the guardian of the knowledge they guard the knowledge under their paws and when you look closely at the paw what do you find? Uh, <laughs> A spherical intersecting pattern of the flower of life which generates 64 tetrahedron grid. Guardian of the knowledge. Uh, fairly old. But the, this, uh, this section of China was largely rebuilt and fairly recent, uh, you know. But it's all coming from very ancient tradition that's passed on orally throughout the ages. And that's why you find still the knowledge being present. Although the knowledge of the sun gods has been very, very confused and diluted throughout the ages. So, do we have evidence of the sun gods? We do. These are skulls that are found in temples in South America. This is uh, in the Peruvian Museum. Um, I call it Conehead. Um, it uh, when the archaeologists found this, they said, oh, this is the result of skull deformation. <laughs> you know how the ancient tradition, they would bend their head to deform them? Now, they did do that. You know, this is the bust of Nefertiti, for instance. Um, Tutankhamun did have a distorted, deformed head. There's many skulls like that. But what, when you read the ancient text and they say, um, they talk about deforming their head, they say that they did that to imitate the sun god, to become sun gods themselves. Now, if you deform your head, right, today, it doesn't matter how much you deform it. 
you will never be able to exceed the volume capacity of your skull. Your head might look really weird, but the volume inside will be exactly the same. In these cases, the volume of these skulls, the inside volume of these skulls, are over twice the natural volume of the human skull. The normal volume of the human skull. These are not the result of skull deformation. You cannot do that by deforming your skull. The other thing that's interesting is that the hole at the bottom of the skull here where the atlas goes in, the spine, tells you how big the person was, right? Because you can figure it out from the size of the spine. These people had to be between 12 and 15 feet tall. There was giants on the earth. Many ancient texts talks about the sun gods as being giants. These are very, very big people. Um, and the fact that there's multiple of these skulls found in temples all around South America tells you that it's not the result of some deformation. These skulls were found in South America and Mexico. Um, here is some of the Mexican skulls. The early ones were South American skulls. Um, this one actually has a larger volume than the comb head. And uh, this one is the largest volume ever found. Uh, Mexico. And uh, the facial features are missing, but the skull is intact and it's enormous. That's the eye sockets, so you can imagine how large that forehead was. And here is the uh, the uh, each lobe, uh, each hemisphere of the skull of the brain, seemed to have developed independently in this case, and uh, making it enormous. Go ahead. On the prior slide, uh, mm. am I correct in saying that the, uh, the orbits of the eyes are a good deal larger than normal? Oh yeah, much larger than normal. This person had huge eyes. And there's all sorts of features on these skulls that are not normal. For instance, in these cases, many of the feature, facial features in the jaws don't belong to a normal sapien. They're mixed between various species that uh, are not supposed to be mixed together. Here is Tutankhamen. Even Tutankhamen seemed to have a larger than expected skull. Here is his brother as well. Now, uh, <laughs> there's many instances in the Egyptian and the Mayan and the Inca uh, scripts where they describe that the sun gods, including in the Bible, where they describe that the sun gods actually mixed and had children with men, with women uh, of the human species. And that that generated a whole new species which was half sun gods, half man. So here, these might be evidence of this alt, you know, altered species, of this mix. And you would expect that these people would become pharaohs because they would have all sorts of capacity that the average man didn't. So here, we're starting to see a whole new picture of the, of the history of human being. And in, mingled in that picture is the information that these sun gods tried to give to man. 